Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this uh, exceptional SER event on, on mobility. Achieving a smooth and comprehensive mobility in urban areas is an objective which features in high position on the agenda of the European Commission. In addition, this is an equally fundamental goal from the perspective of the climate neutrality target and in the context of the digital revolution. And these topics are very central in a new SARE report entitled Mobility as a Service, Mass, a digital roadmap for public transport authorities. Authors Yves Crozet and Jean Caldefi argue that Mass sits at the crossroads of the digital revolution and the transition to carbon neutrality. And as we will hear and discuss more in detail later in the program, our report shows that with regard to mobility, the use of new technology alone will not be enough to achieve the Commission's decarbonization and digitalization goals, and that adopting broad new regulations will be necessary. And this report also provides a digital roadmap for organizing mobility authorities. Specifically, it recommends that in order to help build a mobility sector capable of achieving the Commission's objectives, these authorities should, one, establish clear rules for fair competition, two, adopt a broad approach to regulation, and third, leverage digitalization and data. And the SARE report echoes and, and develops a, a number of points outlined in the European Commission's Sustainable and Smart Mobility Strategy and Action Plan, which was published last December. That's why to start this event, I'm very, very happy to welcome Adina Valean, European Commissioner for Transport. Good afternoon, Commissioner, and, and thank you very much for joining me in this interview. Yes, uh, good afternoon. It is with pleasure each time I can have the opportunity to present our strategy for uh, sustainable and uh, smart mobility and our action plan envisaged for that. Thank you. I I'd like to start our conversation by addressing the, the challenges and, and regulation of uh, urban mobility. In, in your action plan, Commissioner, you indicate that uh, uh, your plan will help and you will help cities modernize their policy toolbox. What is the state of play? Where are we on that point? And, and what are the main directions of your action? Yes, it's true that the plan uh, accompanying our strategy announces the revision of the urban mobility package in the third quarter the, uh, of this year. Um, first, let me say uh, why we are looking at that, because we have seen in the last decade fundamental changes in the way people perceive and use mobility inside the cities. Cities are a place uh, of great diversity in terms of mobility, and this is a valuable asset for them. But this uh, diversity in modes of transport is challenging in many ways. So uh, looking at mobility management, for example, our aim is to increase the multimodality and work with all types of new mobility solutions, notably mobility as a service and multimodal di digital services. We should be able uh, to purchase tickets for a multimodal journey, benefit from interoperable payment options, and see various transport services integrated into a service accessible on demand. For example, right now in Finland, uh, through the WIM app, citizens can select daily or even monthly rides, public transport, scooters, bikes. And so these are the kind of um, um, models we are looking at. The policy toolbox will consider also guidelines uh, for the safe use of micromobility de devices, as well as the assessment of the need for measures to ensure a level playing field of, um, for local on-demand passenger transport and uh, ride hailing um, uh, platforms. Urban fleets like public transport, ride hailing, waste collection, delivery services are already pioneering um, hydrogen in many places, uh, e-mobility uh, by decarbonizing their fleets. And uh, I can only praise that such uh, initiatives and we uh, would like to see them more uh, systematically. Uh, and also if we look in the cities at the growth of the e-commerce and we consider all types of zero emission delivery solutions to respond to the congestion, 
for example, cargo buys, automated deliveries and drones, better use of, uh, well, inland waterways in the city. So all these are things we are looking at uh, to make sure we uh, uh, populate properly the policy um, toolbox for urban mobility. The, uh, this is indeed a, a very, very wide uh, program. And, 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 and clearly uh, there's going to be for more than one mandate of a, of a commissioner to, to achieve it. If, if we can one minute uh, stop on, on the issue of digitalization of urban mobility and the management of, of, of data, of mobility data. What are the lessons that the commission draws from, from the first measures that you've taken in this area? And sometimes people, I worried that there's a risk of seeing a few digital giants using open data as a Trojan horse. What's your position on that, uh, Madame Valian? Well, uh, probably your Trojan horse is a reference to the definition from computing as malicious software. Open data is obviously not malicious in itself. Uh, any transparency initiative indeed comes with risks mm -hmm. that range from personal data protection to public service uh, safety. Uh, that being said, there is no doubt that concerns about risks uh, associated with any open data initiative are legitimate. Uh, and we do have such dangers in mind. Uh, the entire process is to take place within the boundaries of the new rules for data governance, uh, which have uh, a general character. Um, these are the rules we proposed by, uh, in November 2020. But we still need uh, the model related to mobility to assess punctual security risk, uh, risks associated to mobility data. Um, digitalization of urban mobility is still very much um, unconquered territory. Um, most of all, there is so much potential for good for citizens with uh, data analytics, digital platforms, for traveling more efficiently, safer, more sustainable, uh, all while helping public authorities with new data. Of course, we should not be naive and we need uh, to avoid from the beginning that uh, new digital mobility services lead to market asymmetries or uh, establish themselves as gatekeepers, uh, as described well in your report. This is why I'm proposing several important initiatives in this field. Uh, the key proposal will come next year for multimodal digital mobility services. I wish to set up a broad framework that will create a favorable environment for all actors in, uh, in the field of uh, mobility as a service and multimodal ticketing services. And in parallel, we'll also propose initiatives uh, in order to facilitate mobility data sharing and reuse. So um, this is uh, something we are looking for uh, in the future, assessing the risks, but try to make the best use of these uh, new opportunities for businesses and, uh, as I said, uh, benefiting the citizens inside uh, urban areas. What do you think about building a common European data space for mobility? Actually, we announced it uh, first in the data strategy and later in the mobility strategy a common European mobility data space. I do believe it is very important for the future of mobility. There are legislation and initiatives organizing the access and reuse of infrastructure data, also for travel data, for traffic data, both for freight and for passengers in different modes of transport from rail to road and urban or even in, in the inland waterways. Now we need to see what they have in common how they can interact to accelerate the digital transformation of the European transport system. Uh, so that uh, will uh, conduct a strengthening of uh, the performance of um, the transport system. Uh, I think it will help us tear down the barriers between industries and authorities, between transport modes, uh, between sectors, uh, building on the establishment of trustful relationship and secure data sharing environments. Let's not forget that uh, something we have to keep in mind all for this is uh, the need for trust. And uh, this is something which will uh, characterize our uh, uh, thinking towards this uh, common European uh, data. How, how do you plan to, to deal with the 
the pricing of, of road infrastructure. And what are in particular your thoughts about uh, the Eurovignette directive? Um, putting the right price on transport solution, I think it's key if we want users to take into account the impact of their choices. If prices reflect uh, the real cost of road use, it will also be easier for vehicle manufacturers, for transport operators to invest in cleaner and more efficient solutions. Differentiated road pricing applied at a wide scale can also provide significant revenues that are badly needed for maintaining and developing our transport networks. Uh, we proposed to amend the Eurovignette uh, directive you referred to uh, back in 2017, uh, with the aim of providing a framework for sustainable infrastructure financing, as well as fair and efficient pricing of road use. In essence, our goal is to put the polluter pay and user pay principles in practice, which is why we proposed to extend the scope from just heavy good vehicles to include also the lighter ones, to remove basically the existing exemptions. We propose to phase out time-based charging, the so-called vignettes, first for heavy, then for light vehicles, mm -hmm. to vary road charges based on CO2 and pollutant emissions of heavy as well as light vehicles. Um, and well, you know very well that while the European Parliament uh, adopted an ambitious position on that revision uh, back in 2018, uh, we are still waiting for the member states, uh, states to conclude uh, their position. Um, it took them until the end of 2020 to agree a common position. And uh, it's just recently that the trialogues have started at the Portuguese presidency. But I trust that uh, we will see a conclusion of this um, uh, rather sooner than, uh, than later. To, to conclude this interview, Commissioner, I'd like to, to talk about the financing methods. What, what are those methods which, in your view, and other than commercial revenues or, or public subsidies, uh, what, what are the methods which could be considered to keep public transport as the backbone of uh, urban mobility? There's an absolute need to keep the public transport as backbone of urban mobility. And plus, I would say, to ensure continuity of service. It is important that the public service operate as weather the storm, overcome the COVID crisis, and particularly given the fare box losses caused by the dramatic drop in demand for public transport. In this context, the Commission has provided extensive guidance to competent authorities on how they can provide financial relief in line with internal market rules. So we have seen different types of support schemes in form of grants, loans, suspension of deferral of taxes and charges, capital investments or extraordinary public service contracts. All these have been put in place in one, uh, by one member state or another, but I would say in a large number of member states. Beyond these immediate responses to liquid challenges, public transport must serve the wave of the digital and green trans uh, transformation. First, by challenging funding from the Recovery and Resilience Facility, but also from other European funds available um, to them. Um, this, this, in a way, has already started. Um, if we look at the Connecting Europe Facility uh, as a financing instrument, we have seen um, co-financing, for example, a major project in Dublin, to encourage the shift from private cars to public transport of around 9 million. We have seen electric recharging infrastructure and bus fleets in Paris, up to th more than 300 bus electric buses. And in Amsterdam, also an important number, rechargers, uh, depot and public space investments, conversion of major mobility hubs in Lisbon for greater multimodality, for example, high-speed rail connection to the airports in Milan, Torino and Bucharest to use the train instead of the car. So this shows that um, already member states and um, ur ur urban municipalities are um, benefiting from uh, financial instruments around uh, European funds. Uh, in reality, there are a lot of funding opportunities in addition to the Connecting Europe facility and the Recovery and the Resilience facility. 
uh, don't forget the cohesion policy funds, the regional funds, React EU and Just Transition Fund, as well as um, the Horizon Europe with projects such as uh, uh, safe up pro uh, developing you know, innovative technologies for increased safety solutions in uh, urban traffic. So these are all designed to assist member states in accelerating the twin transition and uh, they are very well fitted for public transportation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Thank you for having shared with us your, your, your plans and your objectives. I can assure you that SER will uh, continue its work on, uh, on, on these topics with a view to, to contribute to, to your efforts to achieve smart, smooth, sustainable, and comprehensive urban mobility in the European Union. Now, I'm pleased to, to introduce my colleague, Professor Yves Crozet, a SER Research Fellow, who will present his report on MASS, a digital roadmap for public transport authorities. Yves, over to you. Yves, ton micro. Your mic, Yves. Okay, so, sorry for the microphone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you, uh, Bruno, for uh, introducing the, the report we, we prepared with uh, Jean Coldefi. So, uh, I, just in 10 or 12, 15 minutes, uh, I just would like to, to sum up the, the main uh, content of the, of the report. And uh, the first point, the, the, just the, the three main parts, sub part in, the, in my presentation. Just a, a first one about the challenge of urban mobility, especially for public transport authorities. The second one about the, the fact that uh, public transport authorities are, have now a new uh, element in their toolbox. Uh, this element is uh, digitalization. And because of that, probably uh, we have to turn public transport authorities into organizing mobility uh, authorities. So, the, we have uh, uh, some challenges presented here. Uh, all this, those elements are coming from the, 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 the paper published by the, the Commission uh, in December, in last December. And we, we can see that uh, the, the, the list of challenges uh, for uh, urban uh, authorities is very long. The, the, the most important is the shift to zero emission. And then we have a long list of uh, adjectives, of uh, uh, very uh, attractive uh, adjectives like smart, resilient, inclusive, safer, efficient, seamless. But each uh, adjective is a challenge. Uh, and then uh, we, we can add the challenge of mass and digital revolution, the development of apps public uh, from public and, and private uh, mobility provider. And, uh, we can add, as mentioned by the commissioner, the fact that the public transport must remain the backbone of urban mobility. So the, the list of challenges is, is very long. And we can add another main difficulty for public transit. Uh, the main difficulty is that the, the model share of public transport remains low and sometimes very low, except in denser part of the cities. Uh, for instance, if we look at the graph concerning the region Ile-de-France, you can observe that uh, for the trip uh, internal to Paris, in the urban center, it's only 0.5 million vehicles per day. It was in 2018, and uh, almost uh, uh, eight times more by public transit. So it, it's perfect. But if you look at the periphery, for instance, uh, the, the trips uh, from the second crown of the Paris region to the second crown, internal to the second crown of, uh, of Paris de France, you observe more than 8 million uh, daily uh, trips by car and only 1.2 uh, by public transit. And it is the same for all the, uh, the non-radial uh, trips. So clearly public transit have today a, a problem uh, to, to, uh, to give to people living in the outskirts the possibility to use public transit. And we can add a new difficulty uh, because of the, of the COVID and the pandemic. 
we observe with this graph coming from the survey in, in Zurich in Switzerland, we observe that the, maybe the, the, the benefits of the, the COVID period was a sharp increase uh, for people using the bike, so the, the red curve at the top. But we can observe in the, in the same time uh, at the bottom of the graph, uh, the blue line with uh, a sharp reduction of using uh, the, the use of public transit. And even at the end of the period in, in November, December, we can observe that the, the, the total traffic by public transit, even in Switzerland, is much lower than the, 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 the traffic by car or by or, or walking. So clearly, uh, public transit are, are facing uh, the traditional difficulties, but also new difficulties because of uh, the, uh, the pandemic. And then if now we look uh, in the second part at the, the question of digitalization, uh, we have mainly three main difficulties to, to address. The first one is probably to abandon uh, this simplistic idea that uh, apps and uh, mobility as a service could be a, a kind of magic wand uh, or something like a flying carpet uh, for commuters mainly because uh, it's not uh, very easy to uh, uh, transform uh, users, uh, modal model users into multimodal users. So to change the mobility patterns, clearly we can use the new apps and, and, and mobility as a service uh, system, but uh, it's, it's not very, very simple. And uh, uh, clearly we, we, if we develop some apps, it's a way to reduce uh, the, uh, the the cost of of multi multimodality, and to push people uh, toward a more multimodal uh, commuting uh, behavior. But the uh, the problem is that until now, even in Finland, uh, as mentioned by uh, Mrs. Valian, uh, and even in Finland, uh, the the number of users of apps uh, are very low, and very frequently what we observe in Europe is that a lot of people using apps are using a monomodal apps, for instance, Waze, uh, for instance, you are a car driver and you have Waze and, and thanks to that, you, you stay in your car and you don't change uh, your mobility pattern. The second difficulty is that the, the, the mobility uh, has in fact a, the multimodality as a cost. Uh, we can reduce the transaction cost of multimodality by the development of apps, but uh, we, we cannot reduce the time cost of multimodality, the waiting time, the parking time, the, the changing mode and, and so on. And, and clearly uh, when you abandon your car and you, uh, you, you, you prefer to use uh, multimodal uh, tra public transit or to adopt a multimodal uh, trip, there is a cost for it. And then changing routine of monomodality is not obvious. And, and, and then it's very difficult to reduce car dependency, especially where you have no uh, good uh, public transit supply. And then we, it, it's clear that uh, uh, urban accessibility and amenity uh, is, is a common good, but a common good is subject to uh, congestion, is subject to uh, an overuse and so, and so on. So, we, we have to increase the regulation of uh, urban mobility and in increasing regulation, that is to say, uh, to set up new constraints on commuters. And the third difficulty with digitalization is the fact uh, that, uh, as also mentioned by, by the commissioner, that there is, uh, uh, we have still market power and dominance effects in, in, in the world of, of data. Uh, it was mentioned last week uh, by the, the joint uh, uh, opinion of uh, UITP, the MTA, uh, and the police, that there is a, a, a risk of asymmetrical opening of data uh, and opening of ticket sale. And it is a risk at the expense of the public transport authorities. And then uh, we can make a comparison. If we compare uh, the single European railway area, and we, we know that in the railway sector, we have a lot of market powers and dominance effects. And clearly, uh, we have not to be naive with the, the common European data space because we have also to address 
a lot of market power and dominance effect. And clearly, we need a, a regulator, not a regulator uh, of the European space, but a regulator of the, 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 the data as a local public good. And clearly, the, the, the public transport authority should be in charge of the regulation of the local public good, uh, as of data as a local uh, public good. So the, the third and last part, uh, how to, 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 to enlarge to, uh, the scope of public transport authorities. We advocate in the report uh, in favor of uh, an extension of the, the role of public transport authority. They have to uh, acquire new skills and, and, and to, to address uh, new issues. And if we look at what is the present situation, uh, we are only in one part of the graph on the right of the slide. That is to say, the, from the, the, the northwest to the southeast, the public transport authorities are only in charge of public transport supply and financing public transport. And then, uh, with only that, they have to organize the connection between peripheries and agglomeration. And as we have seen, it's very, very difficult to achieve the goal. But so, uh, in order to improve the system, we have to add the second half of the graph, that is to say from the, 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 the southwest to the northeast, we have to add the management of all the infrastructure, especially road infrastructure for motorists, for cyclists, uh, trucks, and so on. And we have also to add the, the, the digital uh, regulation, that is to say the fact that uh, the uh, public transit authority what we call the organizing mobility authority uh, have to be in charge of the, the, the uh, a public uh, data portal. It is uh, also an important way to turn uh, PTA into organizing mobility authority. And if you look at the, at the graph at the top, you have all the, the, the potential mobility services uh, walking, uh, biking, uh, car driving, uh, and so on, bus, tramway, and, and so on. And if you want to organize all, all these uh, mobility services uh, in relation with the main objective of a sustainable, uh, seamless mobility, you have to uh, gather all the data uh, from the mobility service, from the car data, from the geographic data, and so on. We have to open the data, but not open the data as a self-regulating system, but open the data by creating a territorial data portal under public governance with a list of rights of obligations for all the, 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 the parties uh, of the system. And thanks to that, it's possible for uh, a public transit authority to uh, enlarge uh, the scope uh, of the activity and finally to, uh, to, to achieve the goal uh, presented at, at the beginning. So the, 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 the new scope of, uh, of public authorities is uh, probably to, uh, to, to give immediately to uh, uh, organizing mobility uh, authorities, the management of road, and the, to, the, to create a territorial data portal under public governance. And this is the, those two uh, elements are key to uh, uh, obtain an efficient regulation of our, of our mobility. And also, as mentioned uh, by the commissioner at the end of the interview, it's very important to, uh, uh, to, to advance in the direction of a user payer and polluter payer principle, because it's clear that if we want to keep the public transit as the backbone of the system, we need a lot of, a lot of money, especially to develop new uh, supply in the periphery, and because of that, it's clear that all the motorized mobilities have to pay something uh, to cover the cost of the, the motorized mobility. So uh, just uh, to conclude, uh, I would like to, to, to come back to a, a, a sentence uh, uh, in the document produced by the European Commission uh, in December. Uh, cities are and should therefore remain at the forefront of the transition toward greater sustainability. So if we accept that, clearly, uh, we, we, uh, PTA must be turned into uh, uh, organization, uh, organization mobility authorities, 
with the support of local public authorities, it's very important that local politicians are okay to increase the role of the, the, uh, the, the, the public transport authority. And also with the support of new rules at the national and also at the European level to help the, uh, the organizing, organizing mobility authority to transform data uh, uh, in an effective local public good. Thank you very much. I give the floor to Bruno. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve, for, for a very, uh, I think, exciting report. Uh, I, I really would like to, to thank you and, and Jean-Claude Defi, of course, uh, your co-author, uh, for a, a report which uh, I would suggest we, we discuss now. We discuss with a, a great panel that I'm, I'm happy to, to introduce. I'll uh, mention them by alphabetical order. Uh, Matthew Baldwin is the Deputy Director General at uh, DG Move. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, to, to joining us, uh, DG Move of the European Commission, of course. Uh, Elodie Annen, Deputy Director General of uh, Ile de France Mobilité. Uh, hello, uh, Miss Annen. Uh, Edouard Henault, uh, Chief Executive Officer, uh, Transdev France. Bonjour, Monsieur Henault. And uh, Pierce O'Donoghue, Director, Future Networks Directorate at DG Connect at the uh, Commission. Thank you very much for, for joining this afternoon, Pierce. And uh, last but not least, Karen Van Kluysen, Secretary General of Police. Welcome, Ms. Van Kluysen. So uh, we will, uh, before we start this discussion, I would just mention that uh, you viewers have the opportunity to, to put questions. Uh, you can do so via Slido using the uh, code uh, hashtag SER. Uh, mass normally you should see that on your on your screen and uh, while the questions are coming in I will immediately start perhaps by by a general question before we we move into the the particulars uh, can I perhaps ask each of you uh, to to very briefly uh, give what is your your general assessment of the of the report and perhaps we uh, I would start with uh, with the commission with uh, uh, Matthew Baldwin and then uh, Pierce O'Donoghue. Matthew, over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, you're, you're privileging the commission here because we just listened to Commissioner Valerne give, uh, I think, a very extensive overview of the area. And I think your report is a tremendous contribution to the debate uh, and a vital uh, debate it is. And the timing is very important because we're thinking about a lot of these things. If I may, I think you particularly put your finger on two uh, crucial points which are the, the risk of data asymmetries and, and therefore the really the need to think that through. And I think we can, there's room for a lively debate about where we put the cursor at the end of the day, uh, and particularly in terms of identifying landing grounds on this, what otherwise appears to be a zero sum game between the public transport authorities and the new uh, operators. And the second crucial issue is the financing flows developing the revenue streams uh, for cities. I've recently taken on board, and this is my pre-advertisement moment, uh, the management of an exciting new project in the European Commission, which is to get 100 climate neutral cities by 2030. So I was very pleased to hear uh, Eve pick up on that crucial quote from our recent um, uh, sustainable um, and uh, uh, mobility strategy, because that's absolutely what I think. 70% of us live in cities, 72% of our emissions come from cities. We're not going to get to the very ambitious targets we have to reach a 55% cut by 2030 without a big contribution from the cities. And in turn, the cities won't be able to do that in mobility alone if we don't realize uh, multimodality and indeed we don't facilitate and lubricate that multimodality uh, in terms of prov providing a, a big contribution to sustainable and safe urban mobility with those uh, crucial revenue streams. So we've got to monetize uh, and, and effectively internalized for the benefit of cities, these external costs that we're tackling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Matthew. Moving to, to Piers now, please. <clears throat> well, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, as Matthew just said, uh, we're always a bit nervous when uh, you allow us to monopolize things because we actually prefer to hear what the, uh, the stakeholders who are working on the, the ground uh, have to offer. So I won't be much longer than what Matthew has said for us in DG Connect, obviously 
uh, one of the essential elements is, of course, that issue about data. Uh, and what we can say is that data is the essential ingredient from transforming, for transforming from transport or transport services to mobility as a service. Uh, and, and I think that that is an essential point that you appear to have grasped and we need to discuss today. Um, because we have seen uh, in the report is that uh, clearly there is an identity, an identification of what is the, uh, the value of that data. Um, and we will in the commission be seeking to establish uh, data spaces, which we can help with, and we can talk about that later on. But as the report says, um, mobility as a service can be seen as a way of managing uh, the common good through the creation of another common good, which is namely a public data platform. And the commission will have a role in ensuring that those public data platforms work correctly and do not work against the interests of the stakeholders, particularly those who are contributing the data while making the data as open, as transparent as possible. So we've introduced a series of measures, including recently the Digital Market Act, and that will ensure that markets that are characterized by large online platforms, and we hope that mobility as a service will be one of them, which has significant network effects and which could possibly act as a gatekeeper. Well, that will be our role to ensure that it remains fair and contestable for business and, of course, for new market entrants, while recognizing the public service value of the data that has been generated. I'll stop there. I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piers. Uh, Elodie Anen, uh, you are the representative of, a, of, of a organizing mobility, of an authority organizing mobility. What is your one minute take on the, on the report by uh, Crozet and Coldefi? Yes, hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, at Ile de France Mobilité, like you said, we, we are very convinced that um, mobility as a service will be a, a failure if uh, the public transit authorities are not at the center of it. And that's why we, uh, we take the, this opportunity to uh, give a big thank to uh, Yves Crozet and Jean Coldefi for the quality of the, of the report, uh, which has clearly shown the importance of um, of the, the PTA uh, in the center of the of the game, uh, especially with this role of uh, a trusted third party, and uh, we'll uh, probably uh, come back to uh, to this issue of uh, of uh, data. But I think uh, just uh, in a, in a quick word, um, a major uh, challenge of the future of mobility is um, is for this public mo uh, mobility authority to create the um, the condition for relevant reuses of the data available on um, on those uh, on mobility and we have to make sure that um, uh, all the data that are owned by a private organization involved in public service mission um, a transport uh, company operating a, a subway or train lines which we have uh, in France uh, on behalf of, of the community um, are used by others um, in the sense of uh, general interest, and I, I think that's uh, really what uh, what was uh, shown in this report that uh, we need this uh, third party that makes sure that uh, it all goes into the um, the direction at, of um, an um, environment and the and the the climate change uh, challenge that we have all to face. Thank you. We'll we'll come to that, and clearly data are going to play a major role in in this discussion. Uh, as it does in, in, in the report. Uh, let's move to, to uh, Karen van Kluizen uh, from Polis. Uh, Karen, what, what's your take from, from the report uh, from the report from uh, Yves Crozet and Jacques Defi in really briefly? Well, it was a pleasure to, to read the report and, and the views that you share in, in the report are very much aligned overall with uh, the views that we have been um, sharing in the field of mobility as a service. We published our first mass paper in 2017 already, focusing strongly on what we think should be the role of cities and regions in the rollout of mobility as a service for mass to be successful. So pointing out the opportunities as well as the risks. And I find the same nuanced view on mobility as a service in, in this report in terms of what it can do and under which conditions, but also in terms of what it cannot do. And definitely um, pointing out as well that it is not um, a silver bullet. So what we are fully aligned on is indeed this very strong role for 
the public sector and, and the fact that data is, is um, a public good. The thing that we have with Mars is that there is an inherent friction between the user centricity of mobility as a service uh, versus the greater good that we as public authorities need to protect. And those two are not naturally or uh, necessarily aligned. So what society needs and what the individual uh, wants. And, and that's where indeed the public sector needs to play um, um, a crucial role also in terms of regulating the private sector and the, the new mobility services that come into play as well. I'll come back to that later on. So the role that you define for this organizing mobility authority is also instrumental, whether it should be a transformation of PTAs. I think many of the functions you mentioned are already concentrated with the city, but happy to uh, go into further detail uh, as we uh, continue with the debate. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Edouard Reno, you are the representative of a, a, a major uh, group who, which is present uh, in, in the area of urban mobility nearly everywhere in the world. What is your take of the, of the report? Yes, thank you and good, good afternoon. Um, this report, thanks to uh, Yves uh, Crozet and, uh, and Jacques Condelfi, is a very useful report for all of us. PTAs, operators, and users of mobility. And uh, this is, it is a real uh, centri centric uh, and oriented customer and users like passengers. Uh, it shows how PTAs are being turned into MAs as a trusted third party, and um, they will play a key role uh, to facilitate and share urban spaces and reduce greenhouse uh, gas emission uh, with public transport as the backbone, as you already said. Um, Transdev Group is uh, clearly supporting that idea of, of the third trusted party. Um, mobility as a service must, must integrate all transport modes. Digitalization and the use of data will be a clear enabler as uh, Yves Crozet and, uh, and Jean Codelfi uh, described and shows in this report. And keep in mind that uh, mass uh, in a, is a mobility service and its success will depend on the existence of a real, credible, visible mobility offer as an alternative to indiv individual cars. So and I, I, I like to, uh, to, to mention that uh, these three points are really what I, I could take from, uh, I, I could, taken from uh, could have taken from this report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edouard. Uh, this, this report is, is very much about the intersection between uh, mobility, uh, the Green Deal, the, the digital revolution. Uh, and, and I would like to perhaps in the first, uh, in the next question, to deal with the, with the, cli the climate commitments that, uh, that are, of course, uh, at the top of the public uh, policy agenda. Uh, and, I, and I'd like to ask you whether you think that uh, is it still possible to, to de facto today, uh, and the question is probably to, to Matthew uh, and, and Karen, is it still possible to de facto encourage all forms of mobility today? Matthew. Well, you, you will have seen uh, sustainable and smart mobility strategy talks about the need for all modes to become sustainable. Um, uh, to ensure in the short term, because that's not going to happen overnight, that we have true sustainable alternatives everywhere, and I would say particularly in towns, and that we incentivize those sustainable uh, modes. Um, so to, to answer your, your straight question, Bruno, on a personal basis, my answer to that is no, it's not possible de facto to encourage all forms of mobility as it is. The, the days of the private conventionally fueled car in cities are, I think, limited and uh, Yes, we, we're moving ahead towards EVs and the hydrogen powered vehicles, but even then, even if by 2030, every car, and it won't be, is electrically powered, we'll still have issues of congestion and road safety and the whole issue of how we make cities livable for citizens. So uh, it's exactly the right question. And we need to therefore, again, to use this phrase, look at digital multimodal ways, uh, such as mobility as service to, to lubricate ourselves towards this truly sustainable and safe future that we need to get to. And as you heard the commissioner say, we've got a great toolbox of, of ways to address these issues. We've got mobility management, we've got mass, and we're really ready to get to grips with that and work with the cities, with everybody, with the regions to deliver. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. It, it, it's clear that, that there is a, a very uh, wide uh, toolkit uh, to, 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 uh, that we can use, but 
perhaps Elodie Annen, I, I, would, I would like to ask you how could we regulate new mobility offers to commuters? When you look ahead, what are the, what would you put in your toolkit? Are you addressing me now or? No, no, Elodie. Yeah. Yeah, just, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll come back to you, Karen, in a sec, sorry. Um, well, the, um, I think there is the, uh, the the regulation aspect uh, that you mentioned, but uh, there is also more. Um, we have to work also on the uh, the incentive uh, and how to uh, encourage, how to promote um, alternative modes to um, uh, individual car driving, which is uh, as of today the, the most uh, polluting transport mode um, uh, that we we have. And um, in in France, we. Uh, uh, we have shown in uh, recent studies that um, in the, the very dense uh, metropolitan areas, like, like the one we have in Paris, financial incentives are not necessarily the best way to um, gain model shift. Uh, we had a report in uh, 2018 showing that even if we uh, had a free uh, public transport, uh, we will only push a, f uh, a fewer uh, percent of the car user to public transport. Uh, and most of the others will remain car drivers because uh, it's faster it, and it's more convenient. So uh, as I mentioned, we have to offer alternatives, especially uh, uh, public transport routes that are modern, comfortable, uh, convenient and fast. And I, I want to insist on the um, convenient uh, aspect of it. And um, Eve was mentioning before the, um, the seamless aspect of, uh, of the mass. And I think this is a, something that we really have to work, uh, uh, especially when we uh, also think of uh, multi-modality, we have to make it very convenient um, in the digital space, of course, but also on the physical space, uh, meaning that we have to uh, improve the way we uh, organize the, um, the, the, um, the transport space and how we make sure that uh, uh, the times uh, wasted on multimodality that uh, Yves Crozet mentioned uh, is reduced at the best by a proper layout of the uh, uh, urban environment uh, around uh, train station, uh, metro station. And that's where uh, us, um, the, the public uh, uh, transport authorities, I think, and uh, a role uh, in La France Mobilité, uh, the role we have to play um, into helping uh, this um, uh, to encourage these new forms of mobility and multi-mobility by the uh, the proper layout of the uh, of the transport space, I would say, and un uh, an environment. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Karen van Kluysen. How can mass contribute to the green deal? Well, it sounds like a, a simple question, but I guess it requires um, a complicated answer because, well. First of all, the global uh, climate change challenge is not the only one that plays on the local level. Referring back to the other challenges that Matthew mentioned in terms of air pollution, congestion, road safety in cities, we expect uh, the measures that we introduce locally uh, to tick boxes on in terms of all of these goals that we need to address, including um, uh, climate change and what is at the forefront in, in the Green Deal uh, targets and, and in terms of decarbonization. At the same time, of course, it would be unfair for for um, to expect mass to deliver on on um, on these different ambitions uh, on its own, uh, as was mentioned before, it's not a silver bullet, but it's very often presented like one uh, in the sense that, it, it, especially the private sector, makes it sound that if you offer this very nice integrated app to users, they will miraculously change to more sustainable mobility behavior, and obviously it's not. Uh, as simple as that. We first of all need to have the building blocks uh, to put mass in place, that is the individual services, public transport indeed is backbone, but also the new mobility services. They need to be of good quality and they need to be present. Then they need to be integrated. But if we talk about digital integration to help cities, uh, to help citizens combine different sustainable mobility modes, we also need, uh, as was just mentioned by Rodi, that, that physical integration on the ground, the mobility hubs where different modes come together, interchanges and change and, and, and stations where we can easily switch from one mode to the other. So that's another um, prerequisite, let's say, for mass to be able uh, to thrive. 
So there are many aspects that we need to take into consideration and mass will only uh, be able to substantially contribute to the Green Deal targets if it's um, considered in this big integrated package of measures. And that will include incentives, but also uh, disincentives, carrots and sticks, uh, sticks of the sort that were mentioned before in terms of finally internalizing the external costs linked to, um, to uh, the car tra traffic in our cities, for example, but also prioritizing sustainable modes through uh, space reallocation, and that is long overdue, and the car is the biggest space polluter in, in our cities. So coming back to your earlier question, indeed, for cities, it hasn't been possible for a long time to still encourage all forms of mobility. The role of the car needs to decrease, and we need this radical model shift away from uh, private car use in urban cores. And, and mass can help to that, but will not be able to do it on its own, that's clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Uh, I'd like to us to move to to, to data, uh, Piers. Uh, we we hear the the Commission of Breton uh, calling for a European common data space. Could you could you tell us how do your plans uh, integrate uh, the needs for, or do your plans integrate the need to to create a, a common data space for for mobility data? Yes, absolutely. Um, and that will involve, of course, working with our colleagues in, in DG Move. But it is for a series of data spaces that we wish to create, primarily, of course, acting with the stakeholders in the sector. This is not something which is designed from top down in Brussels, no. But the idea of a European common data space is to make more data available for use in the economy in society, particularly when we're talking about uh, these important uh, services of, of public interest, but while keeping the individuals, but particularly keeping the companies who generate the data in control, as I've said, that's a very important aspect. So it will allow these data-driven applications to benefit citizens and businesses, allow businesses to have resource to a much greater pool of data to design their business, but also policymakers when it comes to the Green Deal issues you've just talked about, for example. So that would apply to a lot of, of different uh, data spaces in different centres. And to do that, the Commission actually adopted last year a data strategy. At the same time, by the way, as we did our white paper on artificial intelligence, and that's going to be very crucial in this mobility as a service, the artificial intelligence, which can only work if it has access to data. So that data strategy did actually set out a vision for a mobility data space along with others, putting it at the forefront of the development of the intelligence, intelligent transport system, including all forms of transport. And now in particular, uh, your question is crucial, and we will be turning that question back to you and to all of those listening, the actors in the sector to actually help us design it. But it's to facilitate access and the pooling and sharing of data from different sources, existing and future uh, transport and mobility databases. So we have a series of things. I won't go into detail, you don't have the time, but we have already taken action following the data strategy on data governance. We have a data governance act in the pipeline to foster the availability of data, set the rules uh, to increase trust in intermediaries for data and to strengthen the, the data sharing mechanisms, which is very important in transport. Uh, we have on the uh, open data directive, uh, a way of defining a, a list of high value data sets, which are kept by public sector bodies and public undertakings very important in this sector, and to set reuse conditions for the data. And then of course, setting technical things like uh, uh, application pro programming interfaces, the APIs, so that different data sets can actually be interoperable uh, and be uh, available to other actors in a, in, a, in a useful, computer useful way. And then through the Data Act, that really sets the relations between the different actors. And this comes back to what I said at the start about creating a fair data economy making sure that everyone has access, but that those who generate uh, the data in the first uh, place have control of that data and or have an adequate and fair remuneration. So that's a whole lot of issues where we, the Commission, will be acting, as well as in a very straightforward way, offering some financial assistance under community financing instruments to set up the data space and, of course, then to provide for the technical layers of interconnection under our Digital Europe program, under the Connected Europe facility, and we hope member states may even reflect this in their recovery 
mechanisms in the program that they're now putting forward under the national plans. So all of those will help. Uh, but as I said, we can't do it without the key involvement of all of the actors in this sector. Thank you. So let's move to, to one, of, one of the big actors, uh, Edouard Renault. What do you think? What does your, your group think about uh, a European common data space for, for mobility? And what is your, your position on, on open data? Yeah, um, on the contrary to large historical um, monopolies or incumbent operators, you know that Transdev has always opened its data to PTAs. Um, the opening of data is a condition for multimodality and for the mass. It gives the possibility to coordinate different transport services. If you let me take one example of the innovation process within Transdev to produce data. Um, during the crisis, the COVID crisis, with our new solution, Flowly, uh, Transdev is able to provide important data related to occupancy rate of our vehicles and main flows on our networks to our PTAs. So beyond the, the debate on the list of data available, the key issue is how to ensure a, pri a priori that their reuse is consistent with local public policies. Mobility data opening must remain a tool for public transport authorities to manage an, an adapted and current mobility policy on their territory. In France and in accordance with the ITS directive, PTS with the support of EDFM, uh, it's a sign uh, to Elodie, uh, and the Metropole of Lyon, they have developed a standard reuse license agreement that includes some requirements. The reuse of some mobility data is only allowed if the user respects the mobility policy of the PTA. It's a balance between encouraging private initiative and public requirements that the market alone doesn't consider. PTAs need to get qualitative data on the needs and use and the uses of mobility on their territories. During the vote of the mobility law in France, Transdev defended that access to data from connected vehicles and driving assistants. I could mention Google, TomTom, Waze, et cetera. And this, this access to data should be by right for the public local authorities and infra infrastructure managers in order to better understand mobility habits and for better traffic knowledge purposes. We have no doubt that Europe should be inspired by it in the revision of the ITS directive. It would make alternatives to the cars much more effective for our ecological transition and for the common good. Okay, thank you. Um, so I remind everybody, all our viewers, that uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can put questions to our, to our panelists and you just use uh, Slido with the hashtag SER mass and uh, we will uh, put the questions uh, to uh, our, our panelists right after this. I, I, I have a question here about the, the role of, uh, you know, who should be the pilot of, of mass in, in, in big cities? Uh, and more specifically, what should be the role of, uh, of public transport operators? In, in their report, uh, Yves Crozet and, and Jean Coldefi uh, argue that the, uh, the public transport authorities should be uh, transformed into trusted third, uh, trusted third parties. So uh, I, I'd be happy to have the, the, the views, uh, perhaps first of all of uh, Elodie Annen, uh, and then uh, of course uh, Matthew, and that I'd like to understand perhaps from, from Edouard Renault, what would it change to you as, a, as an operator? So um, Elodie Annen, please, you are for the moment l'autorité chargée de l'organisation de la mobilité, the authority in charge of mobility organization. Yeah, I, I mentioned it uh, at the beginning of our conversation. We are very convinced that uh, we should be at the center of the game as a at the public uh, transport authority, uh, public mobility authority, uh, just because um, we will make sure that uh, the mass is uh, driven by uh, public interest or uh, driven by um, um, 
um, climate climate uh, change uh, answers or um, uh, issues, and um, uh, we make sure that um, there is a mass there is a, a mass offer in the region that. Uh, uh, goes towards um, yeah the, the public good. There could be other um, offer or the mass uh, uh, promoted by public actors, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, any citizen that wants to make sure that his um, a mobility a behavior uh, goes towards um, um, public good, uh, he can go to our mass and to make sure that uh, he will. Uh, uh, be best uh, advised on uh, on um, the different uh, uh, action uh, or uh, mobility um, um, solution he can uh, he can have. We had this, uh, um, this a lot of debate um, um, previously uh, within in the France Mobility about thinking uh, should we have different uh, mass different. Uh, uh, um, audience, different public, different mass, and then we, we said, well, we need to have one um, uh, mass, the, the one uh, that is the, the reference uh, within the, uh, the Ile-de-France uh, region, and that's what uh, we are uh, developing at the moment, because we are um, um, developing uh, our, um, uh, an open uh, a platform uh, to, to develop the mass through um, uh, the um, an open uh, data marketplace uh, currently being developed and uh, promoted uh, and taking a lot of uh, uh, different action to make sure that uh, uh, we uh, we become the uh, the reference for um, uh, for all the uh, data available on mobility uh, for the region and uh, as I mentioned before also relevant reuses of uh, those uh, data and um, what was uh, said before by uh, Pierce is uh, to me was a uh, very important on the uh, framework that could be offered by the um, uh, by the European Commission on um, uh, and help all the, uh, the the PTA. We are a very important one in France, but not all of them have uh, the same um, resources that we have, especially uh, financial resources or um, 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 strengths um, uh, towards uh, um, operators uh, and we you have a smaller uh, PTA uh, that needs to be um, accompanied by the uh, by the the framework offered by the uh, the European Commission to make sure that they are also um, able to develop that kind of um, offer to their um, inhabitants thank you uh, Matthew taking a, a, a pan-european uh, perspective, uh, how do you assess this uh, recommendation from, uh, from the authors to, uh, to make the, the, the public transport operators, to make the, the public transport authorities trusted third parties who would be the kind of pilot of mass in, in big cities? Is this something which could work in, say, uh, Paris or, or Lyon, or it has merit potentially uh, in, in, in wider areas uh, in, the, in the Union? Well, thank you very much for, for the question. And I think the idea certainly has merit. And it's very interesting to hear Elodie uh, on this issue from the perspective of the Ile de France. And if I may, through you, Elodie, thank Francois Gaspard for everything she has done, both uh, uh, for Ile de France and also in the broader debates in Brussels, precisely to look at these issues. Um, I mean, to reassure you, but I guess to tell you something you already know, that we see uh, PTAs having an absolutely key role to play in the development of mass. But I think, as you just implied a moment ago, Elodie, this role is inevitably going to vary because of the specificities of regions and cities. The Ile de France is a very interesting uh, case because, of course, it's not just urban. It includes the Périurbain and the connections with the rural side as well, but not everyone has the resources as you rightly and fairly pointed out. So, I mean, if you start from a perspective of what a mass is trying to achieve, and I think we all agree that it's a tool to, sh to shift from car ownership to different forms of sustainable mobility. I think it also follows then that the mass needs to be integrated properly into the sustainable urban mobility plans, these famous sumps of a city or region. And I think then this famous Brussels word subsidiarity starts to come into play because there are different ways of implementing a mass, as you've implied, Elodie. 
Uh, I mean, in the UIT rep P report alone, I counted three. There's the, the commercial integrator model, there's the open backend platform model, and there's the transport as the integrator model. All of these things vary. I don't think at this stage that the commission's in the business of saying that transport authorities must be considered trusted third parties. I think we would be very much of the view that transport authorities may be these famous trusted third parties. That would be the language we prefer to use. And finally, just to pick up what you invited us to do, LOD, to take, uh, again, a European perspective in terms of trying to provide a framework for that, to facilitate this. And that's exactly right, because mobility, as Ile France shows itself, doesn't stop at the border of a region or on the outskirts of the, of, of the central part of Paris. And so a lot of this is about trying to find the right way to provide harmonized mass interfaces, establishing principles for how services are operated in terms of the, you know, again, in, in the inclusion of sustainable modes, active modes as well. We need to make sure that they're part of this broader equation. So I'm sorry, that's a rather complicated answer to your very fair question, but I hope it gives an insight as to how we are thinking about this issue from at, at this stage as we approach the the very important uh, revisions of uh, um, the delegated regulation on travel information services and the proposed regulation addressing market challenges for multimodal digital mobile services. What a mouthful coming up in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, same question to, to, to Edouard Reynaud. What is your, from, from your experience, uh, what, what, what uh, Jean-Paul Defi and Yves Crozet recommend would it work? What, what would it mean for you very, very concretely as, a, as an operator? Yeah, um, challenges of daily mobility do not only lie in the city centers, but in larger urban areas that includes the outskirts. If it seems obvious that um, long distance trips, uh, um, that for long distance trips, there will be a B2C economic model for mass, but in city centers, as the study presented by Yves Crozet highlights, it very well, the only viable model on, is on the end of the PTAs. Um, I dare say that any mass governance framework should contribute to modal shift and guarantee the transport authorities' ability to organize mobility on its territory. Um, keeping in mind that the, the mass is primarily a mobility service, I've already said, but PTAs are transforming into OMAs. We, we, we talk about it and must play its role as a strategist to define the hierarchy and complementarity of the different public and private modes and the pricing rules guaranteeing the, the sustainability of the model. PTAs represent the right authority and commitment to bring together all urban mobility services as a trusted and independent third parties, as we talked already. Um, Transver, Transdev is alongside PTAs, helping and supporting them in the deployment of local mass solutions. Uh, we did that in Saint-Etienne with Movisider or in Mulhouse. And our knowledge of mobility, uh, our ability to operate a daily services, and our expertise regarding digital technology give us a good position to take this role. That's why we, we are... Uh, uh, um, very um, um, convinced that uh, the, the, the PTS role uh, is to pilot the mass in the big cities with the thank help you. of the operators. Thank, thank you very much. Same question to Karen van Kluysen, uh, who's uh, leading the, the police network. W mm -hmm. What's your view on this, uh, Karen? I think for, for the likes of Ile de France, in the, indeed, uh, they would be perfectly placed to, to take up this role, but there is not going to be one single mass model, I think. It will depend on the capacity and the size of a city or a region. It will ex depend on the existing public transport offer and also the um, availability of other mobility services. And it will also depend on the level of integration that is already in place. So that will determine also the capacities and the competences of, of different uh, types of authorities. But what should be common to all the different mass models as they might develop is this public sector oversight. 
and, and, and public and private sector interests are not naturally or not necessarily aligned, as I also pointed out earlier, and that's perfectly normal as well. But if we want to make sure indeed that, that mass contributes to sustainable urban mobility or more sustainable urban mobility, we have to make sure that it's those modes that are going to be prioritized in a mass environment. And for example, not the modes that generate the most revenue. And that's why we also need to, to keep an eye on the algorithms that will be nudging the users of mass uh, into certain directions. We already see that there are certain unwanted model shifts happening today. For example, with uh, when you ask for a walking route in Google Maps that it's trying to nudge you towards an e-scooter. That's a typical example of a model shift that public authorities are not looking for. We don't want to monetize walking. We don't want a model shift from walking onto e-scooters from cars onto e-scooters, fair enough. So that again uh, makes, uh, makes it clear that we need that um, public sector oversight to mitigate commercial interests over sustainable mobility concerns. So public governance is key if we want uh, mass to deliver on promises and public transport should be the backbone of such a mass system. Um, it doesn't necessarily automatically mean that the public transport operator should be the one uh, having the mass platform in its hands, but it could be definitely also, again, uh, referring back to different skills and capacities. As for the PTA as a trusted third party or the enlarged concept you propose of organizing mobility authorities, I think it would be a very good scenario, but some of the responsibilities, as I mentioned earlier, that you highlight with regard to uh, OMAs already lie in an integrated way in the hands of, of city authorities. So we have to be aware that the way we are structured in cities and regions may differ very much um, across the different countries and the responsibilities that are already are allocated. So we have to make sure also that a massive transformation of administrative structures would not become a barrier for fast action uh, in, in, in this respect. Uh, but I, I, I'm very much aligned with the idea of using whenever possible, such um, authorities as stress parties indeed, or at least if that's not the case, that the cities are in charge of appointing such a trusted third party with uh, the public policy principles embedded uh, in that DNA. And just to conclude, let me also refer to the integrated ticketing uh, position of, of MTA UITP and Polis that, it, that Eve already kindly mentioned at the beginning as well. So there we also have these principles uh, at the heart of the discussion. The powers to set the conditions for access to public space and infrastructures, for example, for transport services that should remain with the public authorities, but also the power to set the conditions, for example, for the resale of public transport tickets and other subsidized uh, services should remain with those uh, public transport and transport and, and urban transport authorities. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have many, many questions arriving on, on Slidos and now we'll, we'll have to, uh, to sort them out uh, because unfortunately, not everything uh, will be, uh, I will be able to, to address everything. I, I just want to pick up on something you just said, uh, Karen, when you said we don't want to, to monetize walking. Somebody's asking us, um, should, should walking uh, be part of, of the mass uh, business model? Rapidly, yes, no, Karen? Absolutely, yes. Okay, uh, Edouard Renault, walking is part of a, of a full uh, business model? Absolutely, of course. Yeah, it's okay. a part one. It's very important one. Okay, fine. So I'm, I'm moving to the to the uh, another question on on the green aspect. Uh, are you planning? We are being asked on a mobility score similar to the energy efficiency score. You have to show when planning new buildings to prevent individual use of cars. Uh, Matthew, how do you? What's your answer to that? Well, that's exactly the kind of thing we're going to have to think about in the context of the 100 uh, climate neutral cities. I'm, I mean, we're at the early stages of doing that. And, and again, back to what I said in my previous answer, it's not about us saying to cities, right, this is what you have to do. It's a question of finding the right tools that cities can use. And, and then I think uh, maybe to give you some insight as to how we're going to try to approach the climate neutral city project, working with cities to establish their needs, whether it's on uh, uh, sustainable urban mobility, whether it's on energy efficiency, energy production, waste management, all the different things. And what I want to be is the vehicle, a good vehicle for cities to enable them to get there with the combination of the right policy and financial flows to do that. And I stress the word finance because that's going to be a huge issue. So this kind of scoreboard, I, I'm not, I must confess, a great expert on how it works on the energy side. And I want to learn and see where we can bring some parallels across uh, to the mobility side. But if I could just come back to that previous question you, uh, you mentioned, uh, 
And, and my, my good friend Karen won't mind if I point out the anomaly, and that's the thing that's really making me scratch my head about this, that we don't want to be monitor, trying to monetize uh, walking or indeed cycling, but at the same time, we need to build them into the business plans. And the problem is when you know how much, for example, building bike paths or building pedestrian uh, uh, zones encourages active mobility and the benefit in terms of our external costs and internalizing that those, those are, the, the sad fact of the matter is for a city, they don't produce a revenue stream. And that is how something we're gonna to have to factor in in a smart way, and I mean that in the original sense of smart way, um, to enable cities to get there for active mobility to be a crucial player alongside the decarbonization of public transport and everything else. So food, food for thought for me particularly, <laughs> thank you. Thank just you. quick, just quickly, Matthew. Uh, pedestrians, they they are good for retail, so they do generate economic revenue from a public, uh, from a city perspective, because they go to the local shops. I completely so, agree. Yeah. But then finding a way of showing that, and again, monetizing in the true sense, not just bringing money in, but dem in a demonstrable way. Uh, the next question that that comes from uh, from the viewers relates to uh, to plans that. I should ask perhaps again the commission and uh, LOD also. Uh, Matthew or, or LOD, do you have any, any plans to support companies which are trying to create awareness of new mobility behavior to citizens? Or what are you doing to, to increase awareness of new mobility behavior available to citizens? LOD or Matthew? LOD. Yeah, so sorry. Um, well, first of all, that's something that I wanted to mention before. Also, when we uh, we are talking about data, uh, the importance also for the public uh, uh, transport authority to to have access to uh, uh, to the data is also to uh, use them to uh, better understand the uh, the mobility behaviors and especially the the changes in those uh, in those behaviors that uh, we have seen uh, in recent years and that probably the um, uh, the recent crisis and um, the, the COVID crisis would also um, make uh, even more um, um, important. So that's uh, so. In terms of awareness, uh, we also have um, um, a team uh, at Ile de France Mobilité that uh, uh, is um, making a lot of studies um, on the, uh, the the mobility behavior and. Uh, at the very beginning of uh, Eve's presentation, there was uh, uh, um, um, information about the different uh, um, the comparison between uh, uh, the um, the number of uh, people uh, using uh, public transport versus cars uh, within the uh, Ile-de-France region, and it's uh, from one of our uh, study that we made in 2018. So I think uh, awareness is also to uh, publish the type of studies and um, make sure that uh, everyone understand that behaviors are changing and that uh, and why they are changing and uh, I think this is also part of awareness to um, uh, in a way uh, uh, explain to people to citizen uh, the different reason why they've changed their mobility they, they um, uh, and and, um, and go beyond uh, beyond um, um, I, I um I don't know I don't have the um, uh, the word in English I'm sorry uh, to uh, what we uh, commonly think about how people would behave in terms of mobility and uh, and, and that the fact that they are able to change for some uh, for for different reason and so um, that would be the part of um, uh, of awareness that uh, that we th that would be our action towards awareness I would say we. Um, and and we also uh, um, have an action with the uh, the région Ile de France uh, on um, on the peak hour, trying to um, make sure that uh, uh, a, a big communication campaign to um, uh, encourage people to uh, um, change their habits and uh, maybe come to work uh, a little later or earlier on. Uh, and and that's also awareness on um, making uh, maybe uh, in, um, encouraging people to uh, use public transport that they weren't using before, 
uh, because they were thinking it's too crowded and it's uh, too congested. And maybe if we uh, if we have this type of action, uh, that will help people also shift to uh, uh, from uh, their uh, individual car driving because it's uh, more comfortable, more convenient, uh, yeah. sometimes to uh, public transport. Thank you. Thank you very much. You talked about data, peers. Uh, how, what is the commission doing or what is the commission planning to help cities, to help organizations such as LODs uh, to, to, to cope with all those data, uh, they, to, to make sure that uh, they have the, 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 the capacity to, to, to cope with this, uh, with this challenge. And, and, and then I have a side question from a viewer also asking about open data for mobility. But uh, first, first, perhaps the, the, the first part, it's a, it's a hell of a challenge for, for those organizations to deal with all those data which are going to be generated. Yes, it is. And honestly, we don't think that any one organization will be able to deal with it uh, on their own. That is what data spaces are about. Uh, sometimes we may tend to think of a very physical thing, uh, a data space being on, on one set of computers somewhere. That's not what a data space is. It's actually data stored in a number of different uh, systems which can be pooled instantaneously. So it's, it's a virtually defined data space. But what the commission is doing is not just providing the financing, uh, but actually also then the, the means, the technical uh, guidelines, including standards for the establishment of these data spaces. So it involves data storage, of course, but also then interconnection. Um, and that requires its own pieces of technology. But then also then the work on standards and governance of the data spaces, as well, in fact, as uh, cloud computing and edge computing. Increasingly, it will require computing power, which is close to the transport means, whether we're talking about automated or semi-automated driving of public transport vehicles, for example, they require quite a bit of compute power close to where that operation is taking place. And these are all things, whether it's under the DEP program, the CEF program, InvestEU, I could reel them all off, but there are funding uh, possibilities there. But we really think the expertise is what we'll, we'll no one organization has. For example, we talk about a European mobility data space, which it will be, but there will, of course, in reality, be a number of different uh, data spaces. It may be of interest of a bus operating company to uh, have access to data from cities far, far away from their location, whereas those providing integrated transport will, of course, be much more interested on local data, but all, all sorts of different sources. And the data space concept allows itself uh, to adapt. I, I would just want to say other word in case um, I might be seen as being uh, partial in what I said earlier about the rules that the Commission will apply. We do genuinely want to protect the generators of data, but we also genuinely want to make sure that there is widespread access to that data, to have it used and reused. We do know that sometimes when we allow private sector disruptive actors uh, have access to data, they can actually provide significant new ways of doing things, which is of benefit to society. And particularly now, for example, when we're all faced with the Green Deal challenges on climate change, that's something where we feel that we can't think anymore of just a certain group of actors who know each other well in different sectors. We have to open it up. Do you want me to talk about open source, open data, or is it something you'll come to? Brief, briefly, briefly. Okay, well, then I will just uh, do my free advertising, which is, of course, that we've already foreseen this issue. It has to be open data in its accessibility and use as well as just being available to people. So we have the Public Sector Information Directive, which we are reviewing, which uh, has been proposed. And there we expect that if we do manage to really open these databases, and by the way, transport is one of the crucial ones, that is that we can increase massively the benefit of this data uh, fourfold uh, in, the next, uh, in the next eight years. And so allowing the public sector data to be reused including for commercial uses, can really stimulate growth, address the societal challenges, and bring more actors into providing these multimodal solutions that your report speaks about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piers. Uh, Matthew, perhaps very briefly, but then I, I have a last question for Edouard Renaud. 
No, I'll be very quick. I, I very much underline just what, what Pierce was wanting to say, specifically in the context of the ITS directive and the delegated uh, uh, regulations I mentioned. That is essentially about facilitating access to data to support the development of specific services, which I'm sure all of us here would agree are, benef are, are beneficial. I must say, I do find the word open data something of a, of, of a misnomer in the sense of sometimes the way we talk about free trade or the level playing field. Um, I mean, I think what this is about specific data being accessible on national access points, but obviously with a licensing mechanism involved. So it's not about a sort of you know, everything goes and, 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 and uh, 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 an approach, approach to life. We're very aware of the commercial sensitivities and the public sector sensitivities related to these, to these data exchanges. I know I won't be able to come back on, but just a previous um, question that was put about new mobility behavior. I do urge us all to think about that, particularly in the context of the post COVID area. Sometimes when we talk about new mobility, everyone says, oh yeah, we're talking about rules on e-scooters. No, we're not. We're talking about something much broader, much more exciting, which we've road tested literally in the COVID era with much more use of active mobility. We've also looked over the edge of the precipice in relation to public transport and just seen how difficult a business that can be when the public loses its trust in it through no fault of the public uh, uh, transport. So this has been a great lab and I hope public transport has lived to tell the tale. We do need to look at these things. I very much associate myself with what Elodie said about using ideas like PCAR's use, more use of data to enable the future models to emerge. So uh, lots of work ahead for us, including on climate neutrality and everything else. Thank you so much. Enjoy being in the panel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Eduardo, I have a question for you from, from a viewer uh, asking you uh, how to help the development of urban tolls, the péage urbain. What about free public transport solution? Would that make it more attractive? What do you think of uh, urban tolls and what do you think of free public transport, Eduardo? I'm definitely for uh, uh, public to for tolls for, uh, in the city, uh, but uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's not easy to to put in place and uh, with the uh, the acceptance of uh, of the citizens uh, but i'm really against uh, the, the the free trans public transport uh, because we need to invest we need to uh, develop uh, offers uh, if we want to uh, to to get uh, our passengers from the suburbs from the peripheries uh, to come to uh, to get their jobs, to uh, to to have cultures, uh, and to uh, to have a, a, a better life coming from the outside of the centers, and it, it's it's not uh, a solution just to uh, uh, develop only solutions into the centers of the cities. It's it's really if we want to maximize the the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we need to focus on how to develop. Uh, intermodality and uh, and uh, multimodality uh, in the outskirts of the big cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. There, there are still many, many questions, but uh, unfortunately, we, we need to close. We're going to be perhaps a few minutes late, and I already asked in advance uh, viewers for, for uh, their understanding. Uh, but before we close, I, I would like to ask Yves Crozet and, and Jean-Claude Defi uh, to share Unfortunately, in, in, in two, perhaps three minutes max, the, the main takeaways from this uh, very interesting interaction. Perhaps Jean, Jean Coldefi. Yes, so thank you very much uh, to all of you for, for your contribution and, uh, and uh, speeches. Uh, well, a lot have been already uh, written in, in the report. I just want to add one thing about uh, sharing data. I think that uh, if you look, uh, if you ju just have a step back, in the past, there was a, a huge movement to open public data to, I would say, private and all uh, actors. And that was really a good thing. It, uh, the ITS directive, I think, uh, set the right frame for, for that now in Europe. In the, on, the, on the opposite, I will say that now we need to take data from some private actors that have what we call the general interest data, exactly what uh, Edouard said about uh, Waze and Google. Uh, these data uh, are of common interest, of course, and not to, I would say, jeopardize their uh, business model, but just to 
better know what people do in their daily life. Uh, at what time do they start? At what time do they leave? Which route do they take? Uh, how many people? What are the flows? We need to understand that if you want to set up, uh, I would say, alternatives, credible and efficient alternatives to uh, uh, car use, we need to have this data, not to, uh, we we'll say, to replace uh, current services of uh, Google and Waze, of course, but just to to have a better knowledge. And I think this de in the coming decade, we need to have uh, not an exchange, but I say, uh, as we did in the past from public to private, we need to have some more data from private to public sector in, in that perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jean. Uh, Yves, what is your uh, main takeaway from, from this discussion? Yes, yes, thank you to the panelists. Uh, uh, just uh, referring to what was mentioned by Mathieu and, uh, and Karen about the fact that uh, uh, the size of the city matters. Uh, Ile de France is not the same that the city of 50,000 inhabitants. But in both cases, what is clear is that the more uh, you uh, uh, increase the, uh, the objectives, especially the climate objective, the more you have to uh, extend the role of, of the public transit organization, and the more you have uh, probably to change the rule, uh, for instance, uh, in terms of the management of road and in terms of pricing uh, uh, and charging uh, infrastructure. And wh when you have that, when you have a, a, a bigger role for public transit authority, immediately you understand that uh, neither uh, the, the urban regulation nor the regulation of data, uh, the, the, the data uh, opening are self-regulating. So the, the more you open the data, the more you open the, the, the kind of mobility services you offer to the inhabitants, the more you have to increase the regulation. And clearly, uh, whatever the size of the city, the role of the public transit authority uh, has to grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eve. Uh, I think uh, your your work is uh, is really uh, I think is opening so many uh, so many discussions and so many reflections and I hope it'll contribute to the uh, efforts that uh, not only uh, the Commission and we, we heard from from DG Move we heard from DG Connect that uh, obviously uh, they are prepared to to contribute to the emergence of uh, of this mass. Uh, but also uh, everywhere in the community, because clearly we're talking about uh, something which has to become a reality uh, all over the, the community, all over the, the, the urban areas. Uh, thank you to uh, our uh, panelists. Uh, thank you to, to Commissioner Valian for having accepted to open this, uh, uh, this session. And thank you to you uh, viewers for, for your participation. We will have a second event on mass, uh, focusing this time on multimodal mobility strategies and digitalization this Thursday, 11th of March at 2 p.m. Uh, the, the, the speakers will discuss more in details the, the multimodal uh, modal mobility strategies, how to use uh, mobility data as a, as a common good, uh, more information on this uh, event is already available on the SER website. The event is open to all and will be live streamed on the SER website and on YouTube channel. So until then, thank you very much. Have a great evening and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.